Today I am so pleased to welcome Martha Battle Jackson. She is the Chief Curator of the Division of State Historic Sites and Properties in North Carolina, and she's kindly agreed to share with us a case study featuring the Thomas Wolfe Memorial and how this cultural institution recovered after a devastating fire. Martha, thank you so much for joining us. Would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself with our audience today? Okay. Um, Jenny, at the time of the fire, I was registrar for the North Carolina Division of State Historic Sites. Uh, we managed 24 sites across the state. Julie Bledsoe, now Thomas, was the curator for the Western Region, and we were actually wrapping up an inventory of the artifacts in the boarding house, which is also called Old Kentucky Home. Uh, because we were preparing to remove all the artifacts and store them while the house had intrusion and smoke alarms installed, along with other repairs. So I, I spent the next year, six years of my life uh, tracking and photographing the artifacts, helping arrange for conservation, updating records, and coordinating the reinstallation of the artifacts in the house um, until it reopened to the public in late May 2004. Great. Thank you, Martha. So before I hand things completely over to you, I just wanted to ask two poll questions from our audience just to get a better sense of where you're coming from. So here's our basic question. What type of institution are you coming from today? And we know we can't cover them all. So uh, if you're other, feel free to share in the chat box where you're coming from. And then our, our second question here is just, have you also experienced at your institution a disaster or an emer emergency such as a fire? Yes or no? And then, of course, in the chat box, feel free to, to explain your situation or share your story with the other participants. Uh, like webinars in the past, uh, we'll use these poll questions as our door prize. So we'll pull two names at random of people who've answered the question, and you guys will win a fantastic resource from our bookshelf. But I do have to say, you have to be a member of the online community so that I, so that I can find your email. So it looks like you guys are coming from all over the place, and fortunately most of you, 72%, say no, you haven't experienced a disaster, which is great, but seven of you have. So let me get rid of these. And Martha, I'm going to pull your PowerPoint over, and then I'll hand things over to you. OK. Um, while she's doing that, I, I do want to thank a couple of people for uh, helping me with images. Uh, Sarah Beth Lee at the Thomas Wolfe Memorial, and also Mar uh, Marlene Minshew at the North Carolina Transportation Museum. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, Thomas Clayton Moore, uh, excuse me, Thomas Clayton Wolfe, was born in Asheville, North Carolina on October 3rd, 1900. Um, his parents were um, W.O., uh, who was a, a tombstone cutter, and his mother was Julia Wolf, who was a businesswoman in Asheville. They lived in a house on Whippen Street, and he was the youngest of four brothers and three sisters. And um, in 1906, Julia bought an 18-room boarding house that was a couple of blocks away, and she ended up moving into the house, and she took Tom with her. At the time, he was about six years old. Um, in 1916, she added 16 more rooms to the house for a total of 29 rooms. Tom didn't have a room of his own, so he kind of wandered around and uh, slept wherever he could find a bed. Uh, as you can see, he's surrounded by this, these lovely ladies. Um, he was quite brilliant and went on to um, uh, go to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill at the age of 15. As you can see, he's rather easy to spot. He was 6'6", six, six, so he's a very tall person. Um, he was very involved in the Carolina Playmakers Theater on campus. Here he is shown playing uh, in the play Buck Gavin. He went on to the Harvard Graduate School after graduation, graduating from Carolina and majored in playwriting. Uh, during that time, his father died. After he graduated from Harvard, he moved to New York City and taught at New York University for six years, uh, traveling to Europe during that time. 
He enjoyed his first success with uh, his novel, which was originally titled Oh Lost. Um, Charles Scribner's son purchased the rights in 1928 and renamed it Look Homeward Angel. Um, he went on to write numerous plays and uh, novels and short stories, uh, making frequent trips to Europe. Here he is shown getting on a plane in Berlin, and he went home a few times. Actually, his first trip home, he was almost run out of town because Look Homeward Angel was uh, largely autobiographical in nature, and he, uh, even though he changed the names of the characters, it was very easy to figure out who he based his characters on in town. Um, he died at the age of 38 of tubercular meningitis after a trip out west. After Tom's death, Julia continued to operate the boarding house until her death in 1945, and then the city of Asheville purchased the house in 1949 and opened it to the public as a literary shrine, and then they sold it to the state of North Carolina in 1975. The old Kentucky home was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1973. And if you've never read the book Look Homeward Angel, the house itself is uh, considered a character in the novel. So nearly 15 years ago, a little over 15 years ago, this is what the house looked like. And at some point early in the morning of July 24th, somebody broke a window in the dining room and set the curtains on fire. Uh, we don't know exactly how long it burned before somebody noticed it and finally called it in. The Asheville Fire Department battled the blaze um, for several hours while people gathered and watched and cried. Um, this is Steve Hill. He was the site manager at the time, and I want you to notice his dark hair. Uh, Steve is, is actually one of the heroes. He um, managed the project from beginning to end and did a fantastic job. He walked into the very first meeting of uh, all the planners and conservators and curators, and, and he said, by the time this thing is finished, I want to be able to walk in the house and not be able to tell that there was a fire. Um, this is the, the um, view as seen from the Renaissance Hotel, which is right next door. Um, I think it's important to note that while the when you have a fire, uh, the fire department is actually in control of your property. They will let you know how far to stay back. They'll let you know when you can go on the property. So this is a really good time to uh, begin planning, uh, figure out what you're going to do, set up your teams, and so forth. Team, uh, the Asheville community started pouring in offers of, of help right away. So uh, there was an offer of free warehouse space. Uh, just a few blocks away so that all the furniture could move, be moved there. And Steve took the time to arrange for a fence to be placed around the tar property and a tarp for the house. He wanted to um, prevent further vandalism and theft of souvenirs. Um, this is the side of the house that uh, is, next, is near the dining room. Um, and then the, I apologize for the quality of the, the picture next to it. It was. Uh, Taken, it appeared in the Asheville Citizen Time. Uh, that is Julie Bledsoe Thomas, the curator, hugging Steve. And there were lots of tears shed that day, I can assure you. Um, I was actually in the western, uh, excuse me, the eastern part of the state when this happened. And uh, we figured out that by the time I got there, it would be pretty much set and done for the day. So um, I actually returned to Raleigh the next day. and began going through photographs and negatives of the interior of the house because uh, we had actually planned the next week to have every room in the house photographed, every wall, so that we could, when we when all the alarm systems and repairs were done, that we could put everything back the way it was. So I, I ended up making uh, a notebook for the first floor and for the second floor, and um, those photographs really stood us in good stead, although we didn't have every room uh, in every corner. So Steve put out a plea for the uh, Asheville community and visitors if they had any interior shots that they could share with us. And so we were able to put together um, almost the entire interior of the house. 
Um, to kind of orient people, this is a floor plan of that first floor. And um, the, uh, the pointer, I'm using the pointer, this is the front door. This is the entry hall. Uh, this is the room that is right next to the dining room. This is, this is where the fire started. The door to this room was shut because we were storing some furniture in it. And uh, actually, when the people first opened up the door the next that day, they were surprised because it looked like nothing was touched. Uh, we did find out later there was a very thin film uh, of ash and debris, uh, so everything in the room did have to be cleaned, but um, not nearly to the extent of the rest of it. This is the kitchen. This is a hallway between the kitchen and the dining room. And this is the children's dining room. And this is what we call the drunken hallway. So we'll get back to that a little bit later. Um, this is the dining room before the fire. The uh, fire actually started in this area. This is a sideboard that was close to the, the room, to the uh, point of origin. This is the dining room after the fire. And again, this is the, the area that started out. There's a huge hole here. So that was, was the point of origin. The, um, as you can see, that's a better shot of the hole. The, this is the dining room shortly after it was cleaned up. We actually found artifacts that fell through the hole. So I'll show you that in a few minutes. Uh, this is the fireplace in the dining room. You can see the, the blue tile surrounding the um, opening. And there was also a blue tile hearth. This is one of the survivors from the dining room. It uh, was on that sideboard. It was displayed standing up in a, in a stand and actually rolled off the, the sideboard and fell through the hole. So uh, a lot of the plating was burned off, but it, at least it survived. Unfortunately, this one did not survive. This was a beverage set that WO gave Julia for their 25th wedding anniversary. We found blobs of melted silver in the basement directly below. So um, we did manage to recover part of it, but unfortunately, they're just blobs. Um, here is uh, a shot of the Asheville Fire Department with their water cannon. They um, um, really waited as long as they could. Firemen went into the house and grouped uh, um, picture. I mean, grouped furniture in the room. Uh, as you can see here, they they went through a few of the rooms before the fire became so great and grouped the furniture together and threw tarps over them, as you can see here, which really uh, saved a lot of damage to the furniture. Um, one of the first of the museum community to arrive was uh, Biltmore House and Gardens and their staff. And uh, they sent it back out or for, or, da, 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 sorry, sent out for supplies and equipment, including a truck to help move the furniture uh, into the warehouse. And as you can see, they, they kind of quickly took over. Uh, they were very generous in their supplies and equipment. Uh, we offered to repay them, but they said in a way they, it was a, we did them a favor because they got to practice their disaster recovery plan at our expense. Um, but you can see fire trucks are still in the background and um, the police had cordoned off the area. Uh, but you can see they're, they're washing artifacts and beginning to triage and sort and um, uh, set up different areas to figure out what to do with them. Um, we moved all the furniture out of the house by the end of the day and trucked over to the warehouse. Uh, the Carl Sandburg National Park Service folks were there. Um, other state historic site staff were there to help out. Um, this, the, these are papers that are drying in the visitor center. The Wolf Memorial had about, uh, I don't know, six, five, six hundred uh, sheets of sheet music that needed to be dried out. Everything was just wet, thoroughly wet. Um, these are items 
getting ready to be packed, uh, more items to dry out. One of the local community uh, representatives, uh, representative from Ingalls Grocery Store, uh, came and offered to help, and they ended up bringing a trailer uh, because the tool chests and lawnmowers and that sort of equipment was stored in the basement of the, the boarding house, and they didn't have any place to store the equipment. So Ingalls provided a trailer for those items to be stored in. Uh, they also supplied bread trays or bread racks, um, the plastic racks that can be stacked. Those were wonderful for for um, drying out the um, um, paper items. Um, here's a group that's packing the um, each box was numbered and. Uh, here's an example of a packing slip. You can see they just wrote, wrote down a brief description of what the item was and the accession number if they could read it. One thing to note is when you have your accession numbers written in black and they're covered with soot, they're often quite difficult to read. We also found that a lot of the numbers just popped off um, or burned off or slid off or anyway. we had a dickens of a time trying to match things up, but fortunately we had the um, inventory that Julie and I had finished and we produced a printout, so we slowly but surely were able to match things up. Um, the blue tarp that you see here, the, the uh, contractors actually came in and rebuilt the lines of the roof so that the tarp would work more effectively and you can barely see it, but there is a, a fence all around the property with a no trespassing sign. Um, Steve did hire overnight security uh, to keep people away, and they made a few arrests from what I understand. Um, inside the house, the, this is from the attic looking down, so you can see not only did the roof collapse, but uh, ceilings and most of the upstairs rooms collapsed as well. Um, this is a view of the north sleeping porch, which was not on tour. We were using it as a storage uh, room. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the furniture that you see in here, Julie and I had, quote, rescued, unquote, from the basement during our uh, inventory. We found these wonderful pieces of furniture, and so we moved them up here for safekeeping. So um, we, we were both devastated by that, but life goes on. Uh, this is the porch, same porch after we restored it. Um, and again, most of this is original furnishings, um, although the textiles we were um, acquired later. Um, the birthing bed, this is a suite of furniture known as cottage furniture that um, was originally in the Woodman Street home owned by the family. And all of the Wolf children were born in this bed. At some point in the 1950s, it was painted over with a, a light green latex paint. Um, as you can see in the headboard, there's this cartouche that was darkened. And we could tell there was a flower there, but we really couldn't tell much about it. Um, this bed. It, this is the bed shortly after the fire. You can see the, the roof caved in on it. And actually, one of the legs was burned rather badly and had to be replaced. Most of our furniture restoration or conservation was done by Gary Barnhart. He was a former uh, Biltmore House uh, furniture conservator. But he said, I don't, I don't do painting, painted furniture, and I don't do upholstered furniture. So fortunately, the conservation lab at uh, Biltmore helped us out, and uh, they determined that through paint analysis that this was what the bed looked like. And later, a woman showed up and had pictures of a similar set, and yes, indeed, it, they did a fantastic job. Uh, this is that cartouche cleaned up, and you can see it's quite lovely. Here's the bed and the bureau on exhibit along with the uh, washstand. So they, they really did an absolutely fabulous job. While uh, Thomas Wolfe was in college at uh, Carolina, his beloved brother, Ben, contracted pneumonia at the age of 25. So to nursing back to health, Julia moved him into the boarding house, into this room. 
And if you see the rocking chair to the right, she supposedly spent many hours sitting in that chair uh, trying to nurse him back to health, but unfortunately he died. Um, this is the ceiling that has caved in on uh, everything. Surprisingly, did very little damage to the furniture. This was Julia's rocker. Um, but this is the bed, the room put back together, and uh, you can see Julia's chair. There's a, a better shot of it. Uh, Gary did a really good job of uh, matching the, the wood and recreating the uh, arm that was missing and, and rocker. In the kitchen, the linoleum floor was actually reproduced. It was silk screened uh, shortly after the state took over. We had a, a piece of the original linoleum, and uh, surprisingly, that was one of the toughest parts after the fire was trying to get that floor recreated. Um, this is the kitchen after the fire, and if you note, know, in the left foreground, there's a coal stove, uh, which the Carl Sandburg National Park Service restored for us, um, and this is the kitchen today. The, the trying to get linoleum that matched the original floor or having it reproduced was just absolutely horrendously expensive. We were looking at thirty to forty thousand dollars. So we ended up contracting with an exhibit firm to recreate a piece of it that we could put underneath that table and at least get the visitors a sense of, of um, what was there. There were many treasures that we found. This pie safe was in the kitchen and it was at some point painted with a brown latex paint all over it. We had no idea how beautiful it was until it was um, all the paint was cleaned off. Um, this was a cupboard that sat in the hallway between the uh, dining room and the kitchen. The doors are slightly off center, so the fire that came out from the kitchen, the flames, uh, charred the top of that cupboard, so that had to be replaced and then repainted. The ice box, which sat just to the left of the door, was mostly protected from the flames and had very little damage except for smoke. This was the front hall before. Um, if you look behind the door right here, there's a very dark secretary, and this is a very dark pier mirror. Um, this was the, the front hall afterwards, and if you notice how dark it is up here, the flames were coming out of the two doors um, into this area, and note how light it is down here. So when the fire department tells you to go low or crawl out of a fire, this is a really good shot of how the, what the difference is and why it's important to stay as low as you can. Um, the other interesting thing that we found out about the fire was sometimes when the flames are very intense, it creates almost a tornadic effect. And so um, the, the, um, we found several small loose items from the dining room in the front hall as well as even as far as the kitchen. Uh, we found some teacups and, and small pieces of cutlery. Um, this was the secretary that was behind the door in the front hall. And you can see how dark and dingy it was. And actually, we almost couldn't tell any difference because it was so dark before the fire. And this is it after it's been cleaned up. We were just absolutely astounded at the wood graining. And in the front hall, this is the mirror that uh, you saw the side view of. The top was nearly charred completely off. Uh, so Gary did a fantastic job of recreating from pictures uh, the pieces that were there. We didn't even know that there was all that inlay work. The, this is a shot of a second floor bathroom after the fire and then after restoration. Uh, the children's dining room after the fire. The Oftentimes the wolf children would come over to eat at the boarding house and uh, they were not allowed to eat with the border, so they, they ate here in this dining room. So this is afterwards. 
the 1937 bedroom is upstairs. It got its name because in 1937, Wolf came back to Asheville, and by that time, his uh, popularity had increased to the point where he was just bothered so much, he, he ended up going to work in a cabin uh, outside of town. But uh, he did stay here in 1937. After the fire, you can see where the ceiling had caved in. Um, and, and again, we were really lucky that very little of the furniture was damaged that much. Um, but this is the room after the fire. Uh, this bedroom is the room that's farthest away from the dining room. And you can see just how black it was. Apparently, the smoke was. Uh, because the house was added to, on to a couple of times, uh, this, it was really difficult for the firefighters. They um, actually chopped holes. You can see the hole here. Um, that they, um, to get to the hot spots in the house. And this is that same room afterwards. This is the drunken hallway. If you can, if you see it tilts slightly from the right down to the left, so when you walk down that hall, you really do have to balance yourself because it's almost like walking through a fun house. Um, one of the interesting stories was uh, one of the engineers told Steve that she thought she could fix that, and Steve said, "Please don't do that because." The house was added onto, and no telling what it would do to the rest of the house. Well, he came back from lunch one day, and uh, the plaster, one of the plaster guys was in his office fuming because his plaster was cracking. So when Steve went over, he realized that um, she was, the engineer had indeed jack, was starting to jack up the house. So not only did he put it back the way it was, but he threw her off the property. But anyway, that hallway still has, has that uh, slanted floor, floorway, so it's, it's a fun hallway to walk down. Um, this is the south sleeping porch. It's also called Tom's sleeping porch because apparently whenever it was empty, Tom liked to sleep there and sort of use it as his bedroom. Uh, one of the interesting stories is when Julie and I were doing the inventory, in that corner that you see, we most of the, just about every day we'd see this little tiny spider. So we would uh, sweep away his web and the next day he'd be there again. So after the fire, when we were doing the walkthrough, I'll be darned if that spider wasn't still there. <laughs> anyway, this is the sleeping porch after the fire. Um, the, the two items on the left were uh, bisque, and so we definitely could not get them clean, although the one on the right did uh, get a lot more clean than the one on the left. The object on the right is uh, was glazed, but still the smoke had gotten into uh, the crazing, and there was just no way to, to get it clean. Uh, this was a basin that was in that 1937 bedroom, and unfortunately one of the beams hit the basin and knocked it over. Um, so we were, we managed to get most of the pieces, but you can see there are small ones missing. Uh, the cleanup crew did a fantastic job of um, putting aside everything that they thought was salvageable. Um, and so they were finding lots of chips and pieces of things that, that um, we were able to match up with artifacts and put things back together. Um, there were some improvements. Again, this is another piece of furniture that had darkened with time, and we had no idea of our beautiful wood graining underneath it. This is the dining room today. If you notice the fireplace on the right-hand side, I've got a, a better picture of it in a minute. Um, Steve decided that he wanted to put the dining room back as best he could, but he also wanted to use period furniture, but not accession. He wanted the visitors to be able to sit at these tables and get some sort of feel of, of um, what it was like to eat in the dining room. And in fact, we have um, done a couple of fundraisers with uh, dinner in the dining room. Uh, we've worked with the Renaissance Hotel. They 
they would bring the food over and we would do two seating, seatings and um, clean up immediately afterwards. Those have been proven to be very, very successful. Um, here's a picture of the fireplace. Uh, it's originally, the wood was originally chestnut and a uh, local craftsman had enough chestnut that he was able to reproduce it. Uh, the tiles did pretty well um, in the fire. A couple of them were cracked, but uh, most everything was able to be put back. So uh, a new roof. You can see the slate roof is, is back on the boarding house. And a new coat of paint. We were actually doing paint analysis at the time of the fire and discovered that this was the color that uh, Wolf described in his book. He uh, thought it was a hideous color. And it, I have to admit, it, it's kind of grown on me, but it was a little jarring to go from white to a, a brilliant yellow like this. Um, you, you can go home again. This is the, the front of the house. And this is Steve Hill. Just before he retired, you can see he now has gray hair. Um, and he's, he's earned every single one of them. But uh, he did a fantastic job of, of, um, of getting what he wanted, and the house looks great today. So lessons learned. Uh, be prepared. At the time of the fire, none of our sites had a disaster preparedness plan. Uh, we put together a boilerplate version and um, distributed it to all the sites and worked with them so that they could tailor, uh, tailor it to their needs and specifications. Some of the things in the disaster plan include floor plans, uh, noting where the, the uh, locations of pool stations and fire extinguishers. Being a state agency, we have lots of forms that we have to fill out. So this is one from the State Bureau of Investigation. And we also have departmental forms. So uh, each plan is just chock full of information, how to uh, how to organize responses, your disaster response and teams and triage and so forth. Um, training is very important. These are actually images from the, quote, Burnsville Museum, unquote, that the North Carolina Connecting to Collections uh, uh, conducted a hands-on workshop. Uh, we worked with the Burnsville Fire Department, which is on the coast, and they we went in and set up a um, museum uh, using fake objects. Um, these were uh, collected artifacts and or, or objects, not artifacts, but uh, books and papers and furniture and clothing and so forth, and arranged them in cabinets and created a period setting and uh, shelving and so forth. So the fire department really appreciated it. The night before, they went in and, and uh, did their controlled burn. Uh, it gave them a greater appreciation of how to, to react in a cultural setting. Um, and then the next day, we came in with the participants, and they organized themselves into teams and set up triage areas and began uh, treating the objects and uh, uh, packing them and so forth. So really, really good training session. Um, we have developed through the years a list of uh, items that are very helpful in a disaster situation. And every spring, we send out that inventory to all of the sites, and they note which artifacts, I mean, which items they have, how many, and so forth. And then that information is compiled into a master checklist. You see the, the front page here. Um, once that's compiled, then it's sent out to all of the sites and the, the managers so that they'll, um, so that if there is an emergency, we'll know who has the closest materials that are needed. We've also bought a trailer that we've put a lot of our disaster supplies in. The, we've stored at the center of our state, and um, we've got the more sensitive items packed up and on a shelf ready to go. So we can have the trailer hitched up and move those sensitive items into the trailer and hit the road within about five or 10 minutes. Um, this is a, a form that we use, that the sites can use to go through their facilities and uh, check out various areas. 
to see how well they're doing. Um, sometimes it's a reminder that gutters need to be cleaned out or bushes are growing too close to the building or housekeeping's not doing their job and so forth. So it's just a real good checklist to, to go through about once a year. Um, one interesting thing that we noticed in the fire, uh, I mentioned that front bedroom or front room next to the dining room that the door was closed. Because the furniture in there was sustained very little damage, that's part of their opening and closing procedures now. The staff at the Thomas Wolf Memorial go through and open up all the doors in the morning that are available to the public and then close the doors in the evening. Um, you want to try to minimize panic. Um, this is a flip chart that is available through the Southeastern Museums Conference. It's not a replacement for your disaster plan, but it's just to help you through those initial uh, few minutes of panic that can ensue when you, you uh, have something like an explosion or earthquake or a tornado or something. You just go down to um, the, say the page that says tornado and you flip to that flip it open to that section and it tells you who to call what to do um, and, and so forth so where to meet it's just a really good reminder to help people remain calm and it's also good if you've got uh, volunteers that are not quite as familiar with your um, situation that they'll be able to um, use this and it will help them know what to do. Um, this is one that's used by the North Carolina Transportation Museum and notice that they've got their street address because oftentimes when you call 911 they want to know what your address is and if you have volunteers they often don't know what the address is or, or the phone number. Um, this is an example we have each phone uh, at the Transportation Museum and hopefully most of our sites have this flip chart by their phone so that they'll be able to um, um, refer to it if needed. This, uh, this is actually Marlene Minshew's desk. If you note the blue flashlight, she arranged to have these flashlights attached to the phone. So if the lights go out and you can make it to the phone, you can grab this flashlight and um, shake it up and down a few times and then uh, that activates it. Uh, she did submit this idea to the um, um, historic uh, preservation and uh, for a May Day idea and won a prize. Uh, the pocket response plan is, or prep was something that was um, was devised by the Council of State Archivists, or COSA. We tailored the um, template to uh, specifications for historic sites. There was a lot of archival information that we didn't need. So um, anyway, we tailored it and then sent it out to the sites. And then they tailored it to their specific situations, and we provided them with envelopes so that they could fold them up and, and keep them with them um, at all times. Um, the other other two tools that are really good, um, the field guide to emergency response that is provide that you can get that through Heritage Preservation as well as the salvage wheel. All of our sites have the salvage wheel and we have several copies of the field guide that uh, periodically sites can look at the DVD and just re review um, um, some uh, specific situations. But it's a really good tool to help you get organized um, if you don't have a disaster response. Um, one other thing to consider is your insurance coverage. The, as a state institution, the Department of Insurance insured the house, and um, they they wanted to uh, put the house back together as cheaply as possible. So they were insisting that we replace the slate roof with a um, asphalt roof, and that was one of the battles that Steve won. Um, and also. Uh, the plaster walls they wanted to replace with sheetrock. So that was a, a tough row to hold, uh, hoe, and it actually put us behind schedule for a couple of years while we were fighting those battles. Um, another thing to keep in mind is uh, the fine arts insurance. Most of the items in the house were 
considered a total loss. For example, a chair that may have had a market value of $85 was going to cost $125 to have it conserved. So um, in that case, it's a total loss. The insurance company will pay you the $85, um, but they also have rights of salvage. So if they pay for that chair, they can take it from you. Uh, uh, fortunately, in our case, the insurance company was very much aware that um, the items in the house were original to the house, so they decided to leave the salvage with us. Um, establishing networks is a good idea. Uh, Robert James, who is the executive director of the North Carolina Preservation Consortium, has worked very closely with Heritage Preservation and the North Carolina Connecting to Collection staff um, to create networks across the state. Uh, MACRON is actually the Mountain Area Cultural Resources Emergency Network. Those were three counties in the Asheville area that the uh, museum communities formed. Uh, and they meet periodically to have workshops and training. They, they meet at each other's institutions so that they're very uh, familiar with the institutions. In case of another disaster, they'll be able to step in and respond uh, more quickly and effectively. So here in the Triangle, which is Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill, we have formed TACRAN, which is the Triangle uh, Cultural Resources Emergency Network. And there are similar organizations being formed in Charlotte, the Triad, which is Greensboro, Winston-Salem, and, and um, uh, High Point, and Wilmington on the coast. So. Um, I would like to remind you that when a disaster occurs, it becomes a community event. Not only your museum colleagues, but your constituents are going to respond and help you out. So if you're prepared, it really does help reduce stress. And we found that out. Uh, Sharon Bennett, who is an archivist with the College of Charleston, and I periodically will do the, the hands-on disaster recovery workshops. Uh, we were in Little Rock, Arkansas a few years ago, and within a couple of weeks we were contacted by one of the participants, and she said that she had a small fire in her institution, and she, because of the workshop, she kicked, she didn't panic, she knew exactly what to do, she got everything organized, she triaged, she said it worked beautifully. So like the Boy Scouts say, be prepared. Um, I've got my contact information here. If you would like additional information on um, um, thing, uh, materials or tools that I've showed you, documents and so forth, feel free to call me. Or if we run out of time and you have a, a question, uh, feel free to contact me. Great. Thank you so much, Martha. That's just, I mean, those pictures are incredible. So we do have a number of questions, and one of the biggest ones we've gotten recently is, are some of those documents of your emergency plan available for viewing uh, publicly so that people can use it to model their own disaster plan? Um, sure. Yeah, if you contact me, I'll be more than happy to send email you a copy. Okay. And then Jeff also pointed out there was a lot of interest in the flip chart um, and creating one for their own institutions, and Jeff said at palmcopsc.org, there's a fillable template for the flip chart and instructions on their blog on how to use it. Um, so, and I'll also put that link up um, when we put up the recording of this webinar. So let me go ahead and go back to some of the questions we got earlier on in the webinar. Uh, Corey out in Seattle, Washington, he was curious after the fire, who was allowed inside the building to retrieve objects for the volunteers? And what was the process of handling that? Um, did the fire department have to sign off? Was the facility manager involved with inspecting the building and signing off? Um, yes, as soon as the fire was over, and of course I'm getting all this second and third hand because I was not there, but it's my understanding that um, once the fire department was sure that the fires were completely out, they did allow uh, Steve and Julie to walk through the house to do an, uh, an initial assessment. And then they came out and worked with the Biltmore staff to uh, create the triage areas. Um, I'm not exactly sure how soon the cleanup crew got there, 
uh, and I can't remember the name of the firm, but Steve contacted them, and they were there within hours to begin the initial cleanup. Um, and then while they were cleaning up, other volunteers were going in. A certain number of volunteers were allowed to go into the house and begin bringing the artifacts out um, and then take them around to the back of the house to lay them out for the triage areas. OK. I hope that answers your question, Corey. Uh, we have another question from Lynn in North Carolina. She was curious if there was any damage to the stained glass windows. Um, yes. There were several windows around the front of the house, uh, the sides in the front, that had stained glass, but um, some of the stained glass was broken. However, most of the stained glass did make it through the fire. OK. And then Celeste um, in Hawaii had a question. Um, she's curious if your fire department had floor plans of your building prior to the fire. She's just curious, how do they know to group and cover your furniture and save them from water? Um, everyone has kind of pointed out how amazing that relationship with the uh, first responders was in saving artifacts. Yeah. Um, not only is Steve Hill an Asheville native, he knew most of the Raleigh, I mean, the Asheville firefighters. And um, so they, they were, they, most of them grew up in Asheville and had visited the house. So they were familiar with the house and knew exactly what to do. Um, as a matter of fact, the fire chief later told Steve that if it had been any other house in Asheville with similar damage, they, they would have just let it burn because the fire was so great when they got there. But they, they all knew how important the house was not only to the community, but to the nation and the literary world. And so they, they really did everything they could to save the house. Um, that it's a good idea to let the firemen become familiar with your organization. I know when Sharon Bennett was at the Charleston Museum, they would invite firefighter or the chiefs uh, to their openings uh, whenever they had a new exhibit. They wanted the firefighters to become familiar with uh, the floor plans, especially if they change the floor plans with various exhibits. So if, um, the it's it's really good to have a, a, a good working relationship with your local fire department. Uh, definitely. And um, in a few of the courses, many of you may have taken some of them um, earlier this year on uh, creating a disaster response plan with Julie Page and also a risk evaluation course with um, Alex. Alert, and um, we also talk about that as well of creating these these strong bonds with first responders. And as um, Martha shows, it, it's kind of it, it saved a lot of artifacts. Um, Celeste had a follow up question for you, Martha. Uh, she's curious. You know, this was a, a long road to recovery, and she's curious on where some of the funding came from to do these uh, recovery activities. Well, we. Um of course, quickly exhausted our insurance funding, um, which only covered about half of what we needed, or maybe three fourths. The uh, public was amazing in their donations. Steve Hill uh, spoke to several groups. Um, um, I can't think of the writer's name, but uh, a writer came and did several fundraisers for the the um, site. Um, because of the publicity all across the nation, people would just send money. I remember one time when I was there, Steve came out of his office holding a check, and he had, he had just gotten a check for $5,000 from somebody in California. So it was, it was mostly the public that stepped up um, and made donations uh, along with several fundraisers. Wow. Um, and we also just had Dan um, weigh in in Ohio. We have um, our emergency response um, view. Uh, he works for the fire division in Upper Arlington, Ohio, and he's saying um, it's often common or it's common practice for firefighters to group furniture and other large object, objects into one um, spot opening up space. So good to know. Um, we have, actually, before I get to the next question, let me go ahead and pull over a survey. Um, we have uh, a little over five minutes left, so let me pull this out. So this is just a, a, a quick evaluation on the webinar. We love your feedback and we also love ideas. Um, if you have ideas on future webinars that we can do or potential speakers, we love to hear about that.
Um, we have a question from Marsha um, in Northern California. California. She's curious um, if you would recommend emotional triage as part of a disaster response plan. I think it's something to certainly be aware of. Uh, Julie joked that she was a zombie for the first few hours, uh, but I, I don't think that was the case. It was uh, once you – people respond differently to uh, disasters. There are some people who uh, they can't comprehend what's going on, and so the best thing to do is just find them a job and, and sit them over to the side. Uh, there's some people who run around like chickens with their heads cut off. So, um, you know, I think you just have to uh, figure out how a person is responding and find a job for them to do that's appropriate for their emotional response. Um, I know for, for weeks and months afterwards, we couldn't look at film footage uh, that a local TV station had shot um, without just breaking down and crying. It was, uh, it was very emotional to um, to go through that process. The the day of, I think it helped to have folks from Biltmore there because um, as various Wolf staff would start to go to pieces, they were a little more removed from it, and they could they could commiserate with them or just say, okay, I understand, but I really need to know the answer to this question. So that would. Uh, you know, having somebody who can calm you down and uh, and and help with the decision making process is a, is good. And did that um, that experience inform what you did next when you started creating these disaster response plans? How did you incorporate that into these 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 planning documents? Um, we actually have not done it as well as I would like. Um, we and. Uh, next year, have some plans to revisit all of our disaster plans uh, because I think we need to do a better job of responding. Um, we did have another fire at another one of our sites, and uh, I think it's a good idea when you experience a disaster to go back to your plan and review it and see what works and what doesn't work and update the plan accordingly. Okay. And then I just kind of have a question. It sounds like initially after the fire, you had an outpouring of help in the community. How did you organize all these people? Um, you know, how did you assign them jobs? How did you, you know, that's a lot of people to deal with after a really devastating event. How did you guys go about organizing that help? Well, that's where the, the Wolf staff, um, they kept track of, of the volunteers, um, that's one of the reasons why Steve put a fence around the house because there were so many people who wanted to help. And so they took names and telephone numbers and I'm not sure if they called anybody or not because after all of the artifacts were out of the house and in a warehouse, then it was really up to the collection staff to go through and, and um, figure out what conservation needs were and so forth. Um, we were making notes on the printout uh, and talking with conservators to figure out how much it was going to cost for each of the artifacts. And then we were able to turn over that information to the insurance company. And we actually settled with the insurance company as far as the artifacts within about three and a half months, which was pretty good considering the number of artifacts and the amount of damage. But um, for the most part, I think the best thing to do is if you have too many volunteers, they can get in the way. So uh, take their name and telephone number and just politely let them know that you'll call when they're needed. Um, and it's also good because uh, you can contact them later and ask if they could help out with donations as well. But I think several volunteers, um, or I think the Wolf House ended up getting several volunteers from the, the help that was offered. Oh, fantastic. And great advice, too. I just I have one more question. Um, and if the audience members have any more questions, feel free to type them in. Um, I would love you to speak a little bit about um, your experience with dealing with the media. I imagine there was a swarm. And of course, there's always the concern of saying too much or too little. Can you speak a little bit about um, your experience when you guys were approached by the media on this particular topic? Yes, one person was designated to be the media spokesperson, and um, everybody was told if they got a question from the media, they were refer to refer the, the media to that person. 
Um, and again, I wasn't there that day, but I understand that sometimes the media could be a little bit persistent. Um, so you just have to be polite and firm and say, I'm sorry, I'm uh, not able to answer your question. I've got work that I need to do. Please go see so-and-so, and, um, and, and he or she will be able to answer your question. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that your media spokesman is not always your director. Again, you have to look at uh, who is the person who can remain the calmest and not react and try to give out factual information instead of rumors and hearsay. And Adrian points out, too, when they had a disaster at their institution that the media did pull a lot of time from uh, saving artifacts. So really yeah. great advice. Martha, thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, You're we'll go ahead and, and close up now. A recording of this webinar will be available on the webinar archive. And I'll try to post all these great links that you guys have uh, shared in the Q&A. So those will also be available. And then Martha has kindly given her email address. So if you have questions for her, feel free to send them her way. Um, and of course, you guys can always continue this conversation in our discussion board. Our next webinar, we're taking August off for the summer. Um, and our next webinar uh, I'm really excited about will be Thursday, September 26th at 1 p.m. Eastern. And we are focusing on the care of leather, which has uh, come up in the discussion board recently. So make sure to join us for that. Thank you, Martha, so much for your time. And thank you to all our participants for logging in today. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>